Hello, long time no see. Today we're going to be doing a review of Gay Mean Girls 2. So I was really surprised actually. Um, I did a screening of Gay Mean Girls season one several years ago and I was really surprised but pleased that the creators remembered me and sent me another screener asking if I'd like to watch and review season two. So I was very thankful for that. I really appreciated a chance to get to look at it a little bit early to share my thoughts. Some of what I really want to talk about with the second season does involve spoilers. So I'm going to give a very general non-spoilery recap of my thoughts, the usual, what I liked, maybe some things that I thought could have been done better, and then I'm going to get into the spoilery bit. So I will mark where that is so that if you haven't watched it or you want to watch it without engaging with certain information, then you can just pause the video at that point or click out and not have to deal with any spoilers. So Gaming Girls 2 is a eight episode second season of the original series. It does follow characters in the same school but not the same characters that were involved the first time. In these eight episodes we follow our main character Savannah who is working on a journalism piece for a college application and she enters this new community that is supposed to be a safe space for queer and trans people of color at her school and is the only space with that intention and that representation. And she starts to realize that there's actually a lot of issues and concerns and has to think about how she is going to approach that, what she's going to do about it, if anything. So a couple things that I really liked about the series just right off the bat, I really liked the title cards for each episode. I thought that was very cool. One thing that I really loved about season one and season two is that there's a lot of really beautiful things going on visually. So you have costuming, you have the scene setting, you have all of the like little bits and pieces of the characters' personalities that are imbued in their spaces, whether it's their bedrooms, um, club rooms, the places that they hang out. It seems very well thought out and really helps build that world. I also really love seeing how all of the characters' props and visuals and costuming seems to align with those early 2000s vibe that is both kind of coming back into the fashion world now also gives it the sense of the original Mean Girls film that obviously affected the name of the series as a whole. And I also really liked that even though it was in the same universe as the first season we are following different characters exploring different stories different interpretations that we have characters who occupy a lot of different identities and experiences but they also have commonalities. We might have multiple characters characters who are second generation immigrants from different Asian countries. We have characters where both of their parents might speak their native language at home. So Savannah's mom speaks Korean and her father speaks Korean at home, whereas Jen's mom speaks Tagalog at home. But those characters also have, despite their common interests and their common experiences, very different ways of moving about in the world, very different opinions, very different methods of how they engage with others and how those experiences have kind of crafted their personalities and that's something that I always really appreciate because I feel like a lot of web series you'll see you have characters who are maybe tokenized or are there to represent the entirety of a very nuanced experience or you see a very common problem which I've mentioned a lot which is characters where they're kind of there just to be like a face in a room so that it visually looks very diverse but there isn't any thought as to how having a certain identity would affect their actual experience um, and that's definitely not a thing that you're going to get in this series. It is very like authentic and real. It's not a performative type of diversity. I also really liked the inclusion of newspaper articles as props. I think that that again was really good for the world building and it helped a little bit with not having to be verbally told everything through the character's dialogue. Um, I felt like with the main character for Savannah you can really feel her desire to be understood and to feel connected without having to be constantly sharp and defensive even though that's how she ends up acting towards a lot of people in the series. The fact that we can sense that even in some very early scenes or when she is being very sharp and defensive and kind of acting like she's unaffected. Um, the fact we can sense that need without her having to openly vocalize it I think is really important for understanding a lot of her decisions. I really liked the opening sequence. I think it does a good job of setting the pacing and establishing the character and the greater 
their environment of the hypocritical uh, systems that a lot of the characters are moving through. I also felt that her family is a really complex representation of a disapproving family structure where her mom will say things like, oh, you know, if you were gay, I would support you. But she's so critical in so many other ways. Um, she pressures her to care a lot about what other people think. She makes kind of this offhand comment about being gay, being trendy. Um, there's a lot of comments about like, don't be a slut, don't be ungrateful. Like she doesn't show any genuine interest in her art um, and in her project that she's doing for most of the series. Her interest is mainly in ensuring that Savannah gets a scholarship so that they don't have to pay for her college. I think that that was a lot more complex than showing something that only showed up as one form of criticism or one form of abuse. We also later in the series get some discussion around the fact that there has actually been abuse in another way in her family as a child and I like that we didn't have to physically see that that it just comes up later as even though this isn't happening like right now in the moment it still affected her and affected the entire family gone beyond a point that it can never be fixed and I felt like that was really um, a really good choice for again indicating why she might make some of these choices it was really good character building and I feel like it made it feel like there was a story beyond what we were seeing. We were arriving in the middle of somebody's life. That shows really strong writing skills. Some things that I feel like could have maybe been done a little differently. This may have just been because I was viewing a screener. There may be captions now. I will check after I finish editing this. I will say that it was still very clear what the actors were saying because the sound mixing was really good and I was listening with headphones as well and I think that helped. So unlike with some web series that have not had captions that I've watched in the past, I didn't have to replay stuff in order to figure out what they were saying. So it was still accessible for me personally, but obviously for somebody who has greater hearing loss or entire hearing loss, they would not be able to understand what's going on without captions. So I would really encourage you have captions and can upload it with captions. Um, that is always a really great thing to do for a lot of reasons. It wasn't a very common thing. I only really noticed it a couple of times, but there were a few instances where the dialogue could have been a little tighter. So for example, in an early scene, she says, also, I cannot let my parents stifle me any longer. I have to move out. I feel like because we already have scenes across the series showing why she has to move out, I feel like that line could just be, I have to move out, right? We don't need to verbally say her parents are stifling her because we can already see it but generally that was not a consistent problem it only came up in a couple instances. I did wish that we could see more of her um, friend her videographer friend and that we meet in the earlier episodes and then she returns again around like episode five ish. I suspect that that was kind of an intention that we didn't see much of her at certain points and that we didn't learn more of her life because of later in the series we see how her friend feels kind of pushed aside and maybe not heard or not like the friendship is mutual in that way. So I suspect that could have been intentional but as I was watching it I was kind of like okay well what happened to our friend from earlier? Like why are we completely forgetting about her? Another thing that I thought was funny just because I found it hard to believe that somebody in a house with very critical and unsupportive parents would say out loud like in a normal volume <laughs> while talking to someone over the phone like yeah I want to have my teen movie alcohol moment I was like oh my god I hope your mom didn't hear that uh, so I don't know if that would be considered necessarily a realistic thing that one kind of got me a little bit with the like would you do that? I really thought those different sequences in one of the later episodes where she's thinking about like queertopia and it's kind of her mind spiraling out. I thought those were really, really cool. It was a good example for me of showing not telling how her mind has gotten so mixed up and how she feels like she's gonna be looked at as the problematic one through the lens of the safe space group. She's new to the space. She doesn't know all the social justice lingo. She doesn't have this amazing activist resume that a lot of the other members do. I would have really liked to have seen more sequences like that throughout the show. I think it added so much of her internal voice and perspective and it also was just really flexing the creativity of the writers and creators. I would have loved to see some more of those types of things. And I think in a general sense, 
that the show does a really good job of showing how trauma, personal experiences, identities can end up being commodified in a weird way where things feel very hollow or inauthentic. We end up using certain language to make it sound like what we're saying is feminist and thus okay when it's actually not. It's a really bold topic to cover because I think a lot of us are uncomfortable with that to think about how social justice, how different like power dynamics can be twisted and used against people where it's really just a way of trying to gain more power. I know that we see this a lot in like the LGBTQ community where you have white queer people and white trans people who always kind of leverage that as we can never be racist or we can never do anything harmful because we also have an oppressed identity. The myth that there is no harm or abuse in a safe space or in an activist space. So it brought up a lot of things for me watching this series and kind of watching that happen even though this was a lens where the majority of the people in the group are also people of color, as long with being queer and trans. Being somebody who has done a lot of work professionally and on like a volunteer basis around like sexual and domestic violence prevention, in the very early episodes when we see Jen and Savannah becoming friends, pinged for me as red flags of an unhealthy relationship. Jen is getting Savannah into all of these important spaces and connecting her with cool people that she, how she talks down about other members of the group in front of her. She's very validating of Savannah's experiences as being a second generation immigrant and queer at the same time, invites her to her house and is using all of this very high level activist social justice language to show how educated and how feminist she is and how many projects that she's into. But at the same time, she's also putting down everybody who might have an issue with her as, oh, well, they're dramatic and they're jealous. She feels like she always has to be everybody's savior and everyone's helper. So even though she's saying, oh, we could really use your voice, she's the one who leads most of the conversation. She's the one who's talking the majority of the time and is directing everything back to her. Especially like early on, I was very curious to see like, where is this gonna go? Because I know it's not heading anywhere good. Vanna, especially with her film, she's trying to express a lot of things about cultural trauma and generational trauma. Some members of the safe space group have a lot of issues with that because they're worried she's going to be validating stereotypes or making a community look bad, kind of encourage her to water it down and be very surface level in focusing about like pride and community and how awesome everything is and not really give any voice to the more painful parts of it. And I thought that that was a very interesting conflict to have for her internally. The people in that space are almost scared to use the space for a conversation they can only have in that environment. So I thought that was a really interesting thing to me. So at this point, I'm going to start talking about spoilery stuff. So this is um, things that happen about at the halfway point. Second event is something that happens at the very end of the series. It's one of the last scenes. If you're interested in avoiding spoilers, I suggest you don't watch any further. So the event that I'm going to talk about first is obviously the event where Sky who is the videographer, the filmmaker, very highly revered member of the group, assaults Savannah, invites her over to their house. They drink a little bit, they're talking, nobody else is there. And then Skye pressures Savannah into a sexual encounter, as Savannah puts it. First things off, I was given a content warning in the email that gave me the link for the screener. And I'm glad because the scene was explicit in kind of a unique way and that there is no nudity and you're not seeing the physical contact itself but you are watching like Savannah's facial expression while the encounter is happening and so you are watching essentially a rape scene. I would have really liked to have had a content warning at the beginning of the episode itself. The screener that I was watching it was all of the episodes mashed together in one video so I didn't have a super like clear indication. I know there were title cards, but my brain was not really like counting very well um, of seeing when that episode started. So I would have really appreciated having another content warning, but I did appreciate having it in the email as well. It wasn't surprising per se, because I definitely could feel the bad vibes talking down about their own girlfriend to her and how she was so much better and had more of an artistic mind. And I was like, oh God, I know where this is going. Generally, I'm just not a fan of 
of rape scenes. That's just like my personal opinion. I will say it was one of the best representations of coercion that I feel like I have seen. I was really impressed with seeing how they wrote the scene. Sky has so much power in the safe spaces group. They are considered such an important member. They have all the right activist lingo and the correct activist resume. They consider to be doing so much and being such a great voice for the community. The fact that Sky is also rich um, or having class privilege as Jen calls it. So as soon as Savannah's in that room there's already an imbalance. And the fact that Savannah says like oh like I don't really know if I'm ready for that referring to sex and the response is well my girlfriend lets me do whatever I want. That immediately is like pressuring you into something they know you don't want to do. When Sky asks like is this okay? And Savannah responds, I don't know. I'm like, she already said she wasn't okay. She already said that and you know that. She's very visibly uncomfortable and overwhelmed. She's very clearly dissociating herself from what's happening. When you compare it to some of the earlier dialogue pieces with her mother, where her mom talks about like, oh, I know some girl who had a guy sneak into the back of her car. She didn't check the back seat before she got in and he attacked her. Like, you have to be careful. When Savannah says she's gonna stay over at a friend's house, her mom's like, oh, okay, remember, don't let anybody touch you in a way you don't like. Show how stuff like that is terrible prevention education. It doesn't actually help people when they're in a situation where they're uncomfortable and where the power dynamic is already so skewed. So as somebody who does prevention education as a job, I was like, oh my god, like so many thoughts were running through my head. I think that Savannah's anxiety during that scene. She's like looking at a TV screen and it's covered in static. Afterwards, she has a very mixed reaction to Sky calling her and talking about like, I think we have to tell my girlfriend what happened and it's just confusing for me because I really like you. I thought that all of that was very realistic. It was really powerful for showing how like she obviously doesn't want to acknowledge what happened because it means that everything is different. Who she thought Sky was and what she thought this place was and and her place in E and E like everything is completely different now very unfortunately realistic that Jen's reaction to hearing about this and Sky's reaction basically being told like you hurt me you assaulted me both of them were treating this as if it was just a complicated relationship issue a lot of minimization dismissiveness them bringing up like mediation and transformative justice that was such a bold choice like much kudos because actually write in and be like oh people are gonna go nuts over this honestly like that's that's how it is a lot of people will bring up things like mediation or bring up transformative justice when what they're actually looking for is an opportunity not to hold an abuser accountable. In mediation and transformative justice, if you're actually doing it to support a survivor, it has to be victim directed. The survivor has to say, I want to use these things. These are what I need from the abusive person to do in order for me to feel safe. And then the abusive person has to do that. And Savannah even has this little imagined spot, which again, was something I really loved. I kind of wish they would have done that for a lot of the other episodes and not just after the assault happened, um, where she imagined like the th three of them and her, Jen and Sky as children, like having a little sit down and child her tells child Jen like, oh, I just, I don't want them to be here. And child Sky's like, okay, and then leave. Um, and child Jen's like, I believe you, Savannah. You could have transformative justice and mediation, but only if you're doing it with the survivor in mind, if the survivor wants it, and the abuser's actually willing to do the things that the survivor needs them to do. So then later to have Jen bring it up as if it's just a way to kind of rewrite what has happened, that for me was so realistic. And I was very impressed to actually see that in a web series because there is no accountability for Sky. They want Savannah to forgive them, to use different language and not call it what it was, which was rape, to pretend like it never happened so that Sky can continue to be a very valued member of the community. But it was sad to see that mirror the character's experience with her own family, where her family is also expecting her to dismiss and minimize the abuse that her father perpetrated about against both her and her mother. Everybody wants her to just pretend it never happened. They don't want to apologize or even acknowledge that that's what they did. And all they can talk about is how much her being hurt is causing harm to them. You really hurt me when you freaked out that you were injured. Talking about cancellation 
goes along with like mediation and transformative justice where I was like, oh, people are going to jump on that one, but it's true. There's a great um, survivor activist and theorist, Wangatwe Wanjuki. She has some really good points about cancellation and basically it not being like a real thing, that there are no real consequences for abusers in our culture. Watching this whole thing, I was really impressed at seeing how clearly the series showed a rape culture, but not in like the whole structural society way, but even just in the safe spaces group, how it minimized abuse, how it excused the abuser, made how the abuser was very, very important to the continued running of the group and how Savannah was considered expendable. Savannah's reactions afterward where she's saying, I feel gross. I don't feel like I'm real. I don't know how I feel. It's like I'm in a TV show watching something happen to me. That was also very realistic, a really good representation of how she doesn't want to actually put the word on it at first. She knows something wrong happened and she knows something bad happened to her and how she feels about it because I've had a lot of friends and people that I've worked with who have said a lot of similar things. I'm glad that they put as much time into exploring that and it wasn't just like a one or two episode like thing. I'm glad that that was kind of like the big like shifting point for her and that that characterized all of her decisions after Similarly to how with every interaction with her family, you like feel the tension, you feel the history of her father's physical abuse. The second thing I wanted to talk about with her friendship ending, her being like, oh, like, do you want to get something to eat? I t got my scholarship. I turned my project in. Like, do you want to like go hang out? And her friend's like, no, I think I want to be around people who are there for me back and like have time for me. So I was surprised to see that. I'm not going to say I wasn't just because like I hadn't considered up until that point that the lack of characterization had been so limited up to that point for a reason. So I was kind of like, oh, like now this makes more sense. I think what I find so interesting about that is in a weird way, that was actually to me like a good example of the transformative justice that the E&E &E group keeps saying that they want to have where like her friend was able to express that she had been hurt by Savannah's actions. And even though it hurt Savannah to hear that, she was able to like listen and accept it and not try to change her friend's mind. Um, we got to express ourselves honestly, decide where our friendship goes next, if anywhere, which turns out it's not really going anywhere. Um, and Savannah takes that lesson and moves forward accordingly. Like she still has the consequence of she's now lost a friendship that was genuinely supportive for her. We had a very complex character. We had a character who didn't make every choice that was like, even if it was an understandable choice, she didn't make every choice that was maybe good or healthy or kind to other people. And it's really rare to actually see a character not be just automatically forgiven for that because they're the protagonist or because they've experienced um, some really terrible terrible shit and so everything else is kind of just forgiven. That's how it could have happened with Jen and Skye or E&E &E as a whole or with even with her parents where she could have expressed and then really responded by giving her what she needed. I get why the last episode is named The Business of Grief. Yeah, she's gotten her scholarship. She did her project to express what she wanted to express, how trauma and generational trauma just beget even more trauma in her life. But it was really sad to see her and and without having really a, any other positive connections with other people. She had built a lot of trust in herself and she built a lot of trust in her own voice, which is amazing. For me watching it, it made me be like, if there was another season, for example, following her later on in life, I don't know if that she would try and to trust anybody again to try and find another chosen family or another healthy friendship. I felt like it was a very like logical ending when you take in all of the different pieces of the series. But it just, it did make me feel really sad for her. And I don't know, I don't even want to say that like it would have been better for her to end with like trying to connect with other people or having somebody in her corner. Um, I'm not saying that would have made it a better story. I think maybe I would have just like felt like that was an ending that would have sat 
more comfortably in my soul. I don't know, that's a very weird way to put it. Um, but I also can see why they went with the ending that they did. Well, because they made very strong choices for the rest of the narrative, I trust that that was the best ending for the character that they needed to have. I'll trust it even though I, it made me sad. <laughs> if you have not seen the first season of Game Mean Girls, I highly encourage you to watch it. Looking for characters who are maybe a little more complex um, and have very complex motivations, complex backstories, complex ways of relating with other characters, I think this would be a good one to watch. And if you're looking for stories about characters that are queer and Asian, written by queer and Asian people, this would be a really good one to add. This totally runs about 95, maybe 100 minutes. If you're looking for something that's a lot longer, then this might not scratch that particular itch for you. And if you're looking for something that's more the traditional vlog style of 2014 era of web series, um, or something that is literary based versus an original story that is filmed in more of a uh, cinema style or TV style format, um, then this might not be the web series for you. I know I've disappeared for a really long time, and that's mainly because I don't like looking at my face on camera or hearing my voice on camera, and I don't know if that's going to change. So I do still watch and engage in web series content. So if you're interested in sending me a web series that you really liked or sharing your thoughts on ones that you've already seen, then you're welcome to do that. I may film reviews for stuff. I may not. I don't really know what I'm doing. Thank you for being here.